Welcome to Everyone's a Millionaire podcast, where we explore the world of wealth and finance and provide insights and inspiration to help you achieve your financial goals. Do you ever dream of becoming a millionaire but don't know where to start? Or perhaps you're already on your way to accumulating significant wealth but want to learn more about the strategies and habits of other successful millionaires. In this podcast, we'll bring you interviews with successful entrepreneurs, investors, and financial experts, as well as research-based insights and practical tips to help you build and grow your wealth. We'll cover topics such as how to invest in stocks, real estate, and other assets, how to manage debt and save for retirement, and how to build a mindset for financial success. Whether you're just starting out on your financial journey or you're a seasoned investor already looking for new insights and ideas, Everyone's a Millionaire is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the fascinating world of wealth and finance. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Everyone's a Millionaire. I got an awesome guest today, Mr. Dan Gibson. Dan is a great friend of mine, known Dan for many, many years, and he is super, super successful real estate investor, and I'm just really, really happy to have Dan on the show today. Dan, how are you today, my man? Great, Dan. How are you, buddy? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for being here, brother. Dan, do you mind giving the audience a quick little bio on uh, you know who you are and what you've been up to? Sure. So uh, Dan Gibson uh, was born and raised in, in St. Louis, uh, Illinois side of St. Louis specifically, and basically right out of college, uh, my brother and I, you know, knew we didn't want to do the the corporate world thing. So uh, read Rich Dad Poor Dad and thought let's let's give uh, you know rental property a try. So uh, pretty pretty quickly we dove in and you know started buying single family rentals, uh, duplexes, that kind of stuff. We um, I don't even know if this, if the Burr method was called the Burr method at this point, but we kind of looked back and realized that's kind of what we were doing. Um, and, uh, you know, started raising some money for small stuff here and there. And then kind of what exploded our business was we kind of accidentally fell into mobile home parks uh, about 10 years ago, found a niche there and gobbled up, uh, 15, 16 of those over a, you know, seven, eight year span. And then basically when the, when rates were low and hedge funds were, had a ton of cash, we sold a bunch of them. And now we've been rolling all that into storage. So just kind of, you know, started, started with one single family property and worked our way up into more commercial stuff. And now we're doing, you know, self-storage development. Um, and I'm actually now out in Phoenix, you know, doing that. So that's the, that's the quick version. Man, I love it. That's awesome. All real estate for the most part, though. No stocks, no crypto, no no e-commerce, no none of this other stuff, right? You're ultra focused is really the point I'm making here. Uh, all real estate. Um, you could argue we're slightly diversified in different aspects of real estate, but not really. I mean, even still, we still have those first single family uh, and duplexes and uh, rentals. And um, we have a little less mobile home, home parks today, but just, you know, kind of trading up. Uh, as, as you go through it. Man, I love it. I love it. All right, cool. Rocking and rolling here. We got five quick questions for you, Dan. Thank you for your time. Number one, what was your biggest financial mistake or setback and how did you recover from it? And I always like to start with the, the, the you know, the mistakes first, cause we can learn so much from them. So believe it or not, we just wrapped a bow on our biggest mistake. And no way. A four, four plus year process uh, I'm sure COVID had some something to do with that. So back when everything was going great, we loved the rental properties. We had gotten into the mobile home parks. Cash flow was good. Um, you know, we were creating value. We also were trying to side fix and flip houses. And, you know, neither my brother or I were were uh, really in charge of that business. We were just like, oh, let's do it for some side cash. And, and that's kind of, that's when the mistakes happen is mm -hmm. no one was really in charge. No one was responsible. And we got into this big, uh, historical credit. I think the house was on like the demo list that had no roof. There was a fire and we bought it, 
rehabbed it, ended up having to fire the contractor. And long story short, we lost well into the six figures on this. Um, and the reason the bow is being tied now is because part of our uh, profit that we had baked in there uh, were, you know, to be able to sell these Missouri historical tax credits. And we, they, we were told six to eight months to get the tax credits and it took a little bit over three and a half years. So we finally, what? we finally just got them like in the last two weeks. Bro, I didn't know. I had no clue. Hold oh, on. yeah. Well, they had, they have like basically two people working on these files. And then when COVID happened, that, yeah, you know, I guess gave them an excuse to go even slower. And, um, the nice thing is we have obviously long recovered since, since this project, you know, had to pay all of our investors, uh, their interests. Uh, we basically subsidized it with other areas of the business that were doing well, had to make sure our investors were whole. And then now that those tax credits finally came, it feels like cash in our pockets today, but I was actually pulling up the spreadsheets to see, and yep, we still, uh, still were big losers on the deal. So oh, they didn't, man. they helped, but not that much. Oh man, that is crazy. So re the recovery was just time, but it, it hurt a lot in the beginning and it took three and a half years to even kind of recover from it. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, even to this day, I mean, obviously that's money long gone, but um, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, we didn't have the right person in the right seat. Nobody was, or we thought me and my brother were both in charge. So nobody's in charge. And, you know, that's what, what happens. We weren't at the, the rehab site often enough. We trusted, mm -hmm. we maybe trusted, but didn't verify. And, and I, it turns out the contractor got in over, over her head and had a few different people that this happened to all at the same time. And, uh, you know, we were left to pick up the pieces. Man, oh man, man, oh yeah. man. Well, you live to see another day and I'm, lots right. of lessons learned and I'm sure you guys aren't messing with those type of projects anymore. We don't do any more fix and flips. That was, that was, <laughs> that was it. That's right. All right, cool. Number two, can you share some specific strategies or tactics that you use to increase not only your income, but your net worth? So I think that was maybe the transition to single family and maybe even some uh, smaller multifamily into either commercial multifamily properties or just commercial property in general, uh, storage, mobile home parks, uh, could be office, whatever buildings. Um, I think that was kind of a big aha moment. Um, the single family small multi is great for cash flow. Uh, you just also need a lot of it for it to, you know, you to do. make real money. Um, now, the nice thing is you're paying down those that mortgage every month. And when you kind of look up after five, 10 years, you realize, oh man, I've got a lot of equity in some of these properties now. Hopefully you've been raising rents, income's going up, NOI is going up. Um, but with the mobile home parks specifically, we really found that value add where we could come in, take a property that's maybe mom and pop owned, hasn't really been cared after. They haven't been raising rents. They haven't been doing the things necessary to maintain the property. We came in, fixed those things, raised rent, did all the proper things. And in a quick two to four year span, you could really exponentially grow your net worth. Um, I think that was probably the big, the big moment. And the thing I tell everybody, you know, I talk to real estate about is, you know, most people aren't just going to start with buying their you know, first mobile home park or they're buying a storage facility or a big commercial building. Like everybody starts at the beginning. I'm sure your stories, you know, this day and you didn't, you know, you started- $20,000 houses, bro. I say my, my, my first, <laughs> first, first house. In the hood. Yeah. Places exactly. I didn't want to be. No, right. exactly. A hundred percent. And, and so, you know, that's where everybody starts. And as if you commit to it pretty quickly, you realize it's not that different doing something larger numbers maybe change maybe there's an extra zero on something but it's the exact same process it's the same underwriting it's the same closing it's all the same um so you'll get there pretty quickly i think quicker than you'd think and that's where we found most value was created now on the back end i i would say i wish we always would have bought more single families and duplexes because that's just kind of your long term um, your IRA for it's slow, but it, but yeah. it builds every day. It's just, without a doubt. It's going up every day or you're gaining every equity because of the pay down and the appreciation yep. and all those things combined. Yeah. Yeah. 
Nope. And one number that we we looked at when at our close to our peak of, you know, I think at one at one point we had over a thousand doors, the mobile home parks and the single families. And one number we loved looking at every day was maybe if if you know, because you know, everybody wants to pay themselves more, you know, that's natural, but looking at the wealth creation side and being like, I think it was something like, and then these numbers aren't accurate, but they're roughly, we were like, every month that goes by, we're paying off like a hundred thousand dollars in principle on wow. our entire yeah, awesome. portfolio. And so if you look at it that way, that's yes, it's not money in your bank account today, but that's money in your bank account someday. That's your retirement plan. That's that can be your traditional 401k. Um, so th- that was one, that was one thing, you know, we liked doing, and I think it kind of kept us, kept us grounded. And it, honestly, I mean, you know, nobody in this business ever says they wish they bought less, you know, I, no, I'm just never like heard anybody else. say that all the deals we passed on all, all I, I just, I wish we would have figured them out. <laughs> right. So bigger deals, ultra focus, um, persistence. These are some of the things that I'm hearing from that question here, which is, which is great. I love it, man. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Yep. All right. Moving on. Number three. Um, now this isn't asking who these people are, by the way, it's asking about them. Okay. So okay. the question is, did you have any, any, any mentors or role models who influenced your approach to wealth building? And if so, how, right? So again, I'm not asking who I'm just asking you who, how these individuals Well, first and foremost, did you? And then if you did, how did they help you or what they do Absol- to encourage you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, two for sure. Uh, one real estate specific, um, on the Illinois side of St. Louis, I did a summer internship with him and his family. They, I think at that time were in own maybe 200, 250 single families. I think they still own them all today. I worked with them for the summer and that was, that was what got me hooked. Um, Mm. you know, he had me, he had me doing everything. So I didn't have a job description. He was like, you're just going to do whatever I think you need to do that week. So literally the first day I show up for work, he was like, okay, um, we're in the middle of an eviction. It's not going well. So you're going to go. First day? First day. Like, first day. <laughs> it's not and going well. It's not going well. We're, we're going to throw go. you in the fire. Yep. He's like, Holy you want to be in this business? This is this business sometimes, unfortunately. And so that was the first day. And then like the next two days I was, I was wearing construction clothes, demoing, demoing a, a wall because they were moving something around in a fix and flip. And, and so that was kind of when I got hooked, he, you know, to me, I mean, he was so kind, so, so generous with his time and, uh, still, still obviously text with them today. Um, and, uh, and really throughout every key moment, I think of our, you know, of our business and our decisions, you know, to sell, not to sell stuff, you know, whatever. I would always float the idea by him, make sure I wasn't missing something. So, so he was my kind of real estate guru, uh, kind of let me see the light, uh, mentor. And then honestly, the other one was my father. I mean, he just, he, so he's a lawyer by trade. He was always so very well read. He always encouraged me to follow, like he knew, he knew some sort of master's program. Like I, I didn't have the mental capacity to be a doctor or be a lawyer. So he, he, he knew I had some common sense. So he was like, he always encouraged me to do that, but also to read up on it. And that's where, uh, I tell the quick story that, that, um, uh, that makes me laugh still to this day, you know, in St. Louis, Dave, right. Whenever we go to our friends, uh, high school graduation parties, everybody just passes around cash. It's like, Oh, here's 20 bucks for you. my friend, like here, whatever. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you go to, and, and so instead of instead of that, my dad had uh, boxes of books, and he was like, "I'm going to give all your friends. I think I was going to like 20 or 30 graduation parties. He's like, I'm going to give every one of them these three books." And of course, I was embarrassed. I was like, "Dad, do not put my dad, they don't want that." Right? Yeah, they, oh, that, in hindsight, books. man, that's what they needed. And it was yeah. it was rich dad, poor dad, richest man in Babylon, <sighs> and thinking thinking grow rich. Best and books. Best books. I mean, to this day, I, I I still read two of those almost yearly. And I think and, The Richest Man in Babylon might be my favorite book, bro, of all time. Fantastic it's, book. It's so easy to read, too. You can read it uh, in an hour. And it makes so so much sense. And so yep. I I obviously he gave me those three books too. And I didn't pick them up and read them until my junior year of college. And that was kind of when I was like, okay, like corporate world, not why. to me. Yeah. yeah. 
Your so. dad's amazing human man. He's, <laughs> he's a mentor to me too. Just, you know, indirectly of course, but yeah. he's helped me so much. So yeah. I love it. Yeah. that's amazing. Awesome. All right. Number four. Um, how do you balance risk and reward when you're making investment decisions? Whew. It's a tough one. I know. That's the question, man. Uh, you know, obviously there is risk in doing this. You know, everyone has those deals I talked about where we lost, lost money. I know, you know, you have your, your awful deals too. That's, yeah, that's the name of the game. Three, three deals. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think the most important thing is being committed to what you're doing. Now we can number crunch and analyze all day, but as long as you're committed, when problems come up, cause they will come up, you can figure out creative solutions. Now, of course, it's fun to talk about the rental portfolio today because we have a great team in place where, you know, I don't ever hear about anything unless it's like really escalated. But at the beginning, I'm sure as you, you did, like I was our handyman and I'm not a handy person at all. I was a YouTube handyman and, Same. you know, we didn't have the money to keep hiring expensive plumbers at HVAC. So if I could figure it out from YouTube, guess what? I was down there at the first couple of units trying to fix it. I tried patching drywall. I quickly realized I wasn't really good at any of this. <laughs> um, but, but you, you know, and the money's not there. And, and so balancing risk, risk and reward, I think you have to be committed. You have to understand it's the long haul. Now, in the grand scheme of things, you know, real estate, real estate is not, it's, you know, you can, you can become very wealthy and rich in the shortest time possible, you know, of any other asset class that's, you know, that's been proven, but agreed. I, th I think you naturally have to have a little risk. Um, I think you also, you know, having a mentor, you know, whether it's someone like us, whether it's someone in town, get that first deal, that second deal going. And then it's, it's amazing how your learning curve, you know, what you thought was risky and you would never do it. Now, all of a sudden you're like, oh, that was easy. That wasn't actually risky at all. Um, and, and Risk is really the unknown, in my opinion. That's kind of how I sure. define it, right? It's, you know, there's always going to be some risk, but the more unknown you go into a project or a property or an investment, the bigger the risk is because of all those items right there. So hundred percent. And it's also why we all start with that $30,000 rental because it's like, we okay, can lose 30. We don't want to lose 300. <laughs> right. We can, we can figure that out. If, if we're raising, you know, if we've got a, a family friend who's going to loan us, you know, 15 grand to help get us going on that. It's like, okay, I can figure out how to pay that back. Yeah. I can get um, that back. If everything goes to hell for sure, right. we'll figure it out. And so that's where I think, you know, having some sort of mentor, having, you know, the ability to ask, right? Because a lot of people will either just, you know, analysis paralysis to death or they just, they just won't ask because maybe they're slightly embarrassed. They've never done a deal. I mean, that's what all these real estate clubs, you know, we, and you were too, because that's where we met is you yep. would go to all the real estate clubs in St. Louis and we'd go to the three or four of them every month. And there was one last night and I was so upset that I couldn't go. I had other things and other obligations, but I'm still going. I, love I know it. it's, it's the best. And, mm -hmm. and so I think, I think that's, that would be, that's always my suggestions. Find someone who's doing it, you know, everyone's and everyone's way more generous than with their time than I think most people think, you know, it's like, Oh, I don't want to bug that person. It's like, you're not, we love real estate. We love talking real estate and seeing that little light bulb click on to someone who's maybe just you know, been working in a cubicle or, you know, working the corporate life who's been doing well, been promoted, has decent money, but they know that they want more. There's more out there. They want to retire earlier than maybe it's looking like seeing that light bulb, you know, go on is, is the best, you know, that, that is, that just puts smile on my face. And I think most people like us are very generous with their time. And, and, uh, so that, that would be my, suggestion that's a great that's a great suggestion i love it all right we're rounding third base man F fifth and final question here okay uh this is my favorite question uh so looking back what advice would you give your younger self about building wealth right like if you're talking to that junior in college but yourself of course what, what would you say to yourself 
I, I kind of already touched on it with, you know, trying to, to buy more, but you know, I think, I think I would have maybe even tried to bring more partners in to, to buy more. So, you know, our, our, our business is mainly our families, me and my brother. And then, you know, my dad, you know, helped us raise cash when we were getting into some of the bigger deals. Uh, but my brother and I basically ran it all. I also have a kind of a side, a side partnership with one of my best friends from high school. And that's gone very well. Um, he was in the corporate world and, you know, now he's, you know, basically running that side of the business full time. I think I would have done more of that because one, you're working with people you like. I talk to, you know, my brother and, and, uh, you know, my best friend from high school every day, or and certainly every week, no matter what. So we might as well be also trying to, to, uh, build wealth together. Sure. Um, I think, I think more creative partnerships now partnerships can be tricky, but I think if there are already people in your warm, natural market, uh, that's one thing I think I wish I would have done more of. Um, instead of, because we used to analyze deals be like, oh, do we have the bandwidth to add this property? Like, yeah, it makes sense. You know, but we said no on a handful of things because we were just like, uh, I can't manage another property or my brother Nick can't manage another property. And I wish we would have, I'm doing some more of those strategic partnerships today, but I wish I would have started at the same time I was getting our main business going. Um, uh, cause again, you look back and see like, oh, what, what could that have been today? So, and that is, that is excellent advice. I heard an analogy the other day. I can't remember who told, I think it was Philip Blake actually told me you, I just interviewed him yesterday for the same exact podcast here. And he was saying, you know, I'd much rather have a slice of a watermelon than the whole grape, yep. you know? And it's like, man, I love that analogy. Cause you know, having a percentage of a deal or a percentage of a business versus, you know, and that business can, can typically grow so much faster and so much bigger than when you just own a hundred percent of it yourself. You're so limited, right? There's only so much time in the day. There's only so much available capital. You know, you start partnering and bringing in, in investors and partners. I mean, that, that it just opens it all up. So, yeah, no. And I mean, and it, that's definitely a change in mentality and it's also kind of an ego check, right? So that was part of, uh, my wife and I's conversation about moving out to Phoenix because we were moving out here with one of the partnerships that was, you know, and I'm as you know, it. you know, yeah, you, you're the best for it. And I mean, this thing is going to grow so much bigger than all of us. Yeah. We're both Agreed. very small pieces of it. And, you know, I was talking to Jess, my wife about, it, and I was like, you know, one concern is, you know, you do this all by yourself. You build your own business. You have success, you know, um, you know, for better or for worse, a little ego, a little swagger comes with that. And it's like, like now you're taking back the back seat, right? Cause this is a, this is a huge thing, a huge business. And, you know, can your ego handle it? Right. And, uh, so I thought that was an interesting conversation, but ultimately it was, Hey, let's build something so much greater than ourselves and so much greater than our current businesses. And yeah, let's, let's invite all of our friends. Let's like, let's do it all together. And I mean, I can't wait to see what that is and seven, eight, 10 years. So, man, I love it. Dan, thank you so much for your time. That's it. We're that's super short it. episodes, but so much value here, man. This has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Any parting words to the audience? Just start. It goes so much faster. You can't control. Like I, I tell people, you know, my, my, my best advice is if you're going to start in rentals where most people start, you have to commit to getting to 10 doors, 10 doors gets you that little bit of economies of scale um, because it's very hard to cash flow with one with rental property. Yeah. yeah. It's just a hot water heater goes out a roof. And and honestly, that's, that's the world testing you. I guarantee you the first mm -hmm. property you buy, something's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> that's the world testing you. I got one of my other high school buddies into buying rentals and I think he's up to 30 now. Nice. Uh, we, we, we fixed, we fixed up a house. We honestly would have kept it for ourselves, but he, he was trying to get in. I was like, well, as long as you're cool with me making a little profit, like I'll sell you this rental. Um, and he was like, yeah, done. I have to commit. I'm doing it. And we closed on the house within the first two weeks of ownership, a tree fell and smashed half the house. And I mean, it's just like, you can't make it up. Right. Luckily, obviously, of course you have insurance and he was made whole, but again, like that was 
a now a four month process of getting a tenant in. And, and he was just like, are you kidding me? I go, dude, this is how it works, man. Like we had a massive water, like a flat roof leak in one of our first properties. And we were like, I don't know why anybody ever gets into real estate. Um, so yeah, you got to commit to 10, 10 is the economies of scale number. And that will allow you to cash flow when the inevitable, you know, nonsense happens. Um, but no, I, I appreciate it, Dave. This, this is great. I, I hope people uh, take these nuggets because it's good stuff. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Dan. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Everyone's a Millionaire. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and that you've gained some valuable insights and ideas to help you build and grow your own wealth. We want to thank our guests for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. And we also want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and joining us on this journey of financial discovery. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to us on our website or on social media. Remember, at Everyone's a Millionaire, we believe that wealth is within reach for everyone. And we're here to help you achieve your financial goals. So until next time, keep hustling, keep learning, and keep building your wealth. Signing off.